Hi everyone, my name is Brant Portner. I'm an environmental education specialist with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And you're watching another episode of From the Field. Today we're here with Steve Ferrari. He's a land manager in the Southeast region. And we're gonna be talking about prescribed fire. So first of all, uh, you may notice that we're wearing clothing that's a little different than you would typically see us in or that we typically wear. Um, what exactly are we doing here today, Steve? So first, the clothing we're wearing is Nomex, so it's a protective clothing. Um, we also wear hard hats uh, if, we're, if we're working with firewalls, so I have gloves on and eye protection. Um, but the main thing we're doing here today is keeping fields fields. So you can see here in the background, uh, we have a lot of uh, woody uh, species coming up. Uh, some of this is non-native uh, autumn olive. We also have some native sumac in the back. But um, fire is a tool that we can use to hit basically the reset button. Uh, so we can keep fields fields and not allow them to eventually turn into forest. Gotcha. So prescribed fire, I hear that term a lot. How is that different from, say, a wildfire that, you know, I think a lot of us see on TV now, uh, especially out west or even all around the world, um, real big fires even burning down homes and stuff like that? Yeah, so prescribed fire, it's in its name, prescription. So, you know, there's a very careful uh, pr weather parameters that we burn within. Obviously, we don't want to burn when it's really hot and dry and we haven't had rain for a while. Um, and then we also can't burn when it just rained or it's really cold out there. So we, we try to really uh, fine tune our weather so that way our fire behavior is, you know, on that lower end of things. You know, fire for us is usually going across the, the ground. It's not really, it doesn't really get in the trees or like okay. you see on the news out west. Gotcha. So um, it sounds like it's, it's, like you said, controlled. Um, what are some of the safety measures that you have or the equipment you have here or, or the different people that are working on the fire line uh, may have qualification wise to sure. do these fires. Sure. So besides the clothing we wear, um, all of our staff is highly trained. Uh, there's a number of courses you have to take in order to become um, able to be participating in burns. Um, as far as other equipment, we have um, engines that we use. Some of them are on the smaller side, like a UTV. Um, it has a pump on there, can hold anywhere from 50 to 100 gallons of water. Um, and then we have bigger engines, um, like our what we call a Type 6, or it looks like a pickup truck, basically, with a, a larger capacity of water and a larger pump on it. Gotcha. So you were mentioning here we're in the field. Um, we have some invasive, invasive automob behind us that we're sort of trying to knock back and maybe favor some fire-adapted species or or sort of grassland species. Would you also burn uh, woodlots or forested areas? And how sort of would that differ from your goals here on this field? Sure, so our, our goals here, like we mentioned, are to kind of get rid of these wood, this woody vegetation and um, you know get the clock reset and allow this herbaceous material, this grasses and wildflowers to kind of come back. In the forest setting, um, differencing of, of objectives there, but a lot of times we're looking to um, promote oak regeneration in a forested burn. So we're looking to burn through that leaf litter, uh, top kill those maples and birches that aren't as beneficial for wildlife, and then promote those oak seedlings um, that are obviously more beneficial. They provide mass, a little bit better browse quality. So a little bit different in there, but so our, you know, like I said, the fire's just kind of creeping through the leaf litter, you know, maybe one to two foot flame lengths tops. Cool. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And it's really cool to see sort of the difference in results, which we're gonna hopefully take a look at at the end here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a bit of a break from us talking. We're gonna look at some fire that's actually being put on the landscape, some of the tools that are being used. And then uh, we'll talk with Steve again and look at sort of the results of this burn and, and if those objectives were made. Alrighty, so we've actually managed to complete the burn here. Um, I'm fairly surprised, in fact, how quickly this cooled down. We're already, in, we're actually in the burned area. Um, so, Steve, tell me a little bit about this unit here, uh, the objectives we talked about in the beginning, and how that compares to the actual results we're looking at. Yeah, sure. So, um, this field was roughly, let's just say, 20-ish acres. Um, had a lot of woody vegetation coming in, a lot of multiflora rows, a lot of autumn olive. Uh, a lot of tulip tree or tulip poplar coming in, 
Um, so those were the really main objectives that we wanted to knock back. Um, like I said earlier, you know, we want to keep these in field settings. Um, so uh, weather conditions today and fuel conditions are great for this burn. Uh, all of our woodies are, you can see they're black, they're, they're, they're blistering at the bottom. Um, so they're definitely going to top kill all these species and really, really set this back. So we really hit a lot of our objectives today. Cool. Yeah, this is looking great. Um, and it's definitely completing its objectives here. Um, and then, you know, I think a lot of these grasses, right, will they uh, sort of just come right back and, and sort of look rejuvenated? Yeah, so we're at the, uh, we're at the end of March here, almost in early April. Um, so within a couple days, uh, this thing will be starting to green up already. A lot of wildflowers, a lot of grass species will start to, to push um, now that we're getting warmer temperatures and we'll get some rains on this. So how would you say uh, it's going to look maybe a year or two from now or even how long do you think it would be until it sort of looked like it did prior to us doing this burn? Yeah, so within a year, actually within probably a couple months, most people probably won't even be able to tell that this area was burned, uh, especially in a field setting where you don't have trees with, you know, black around the bottom. Um, so like I said, a couple months, this won't even look like it's burned. A year or so from now, you probably won't have this woody vegetation. It'll be mainly dominated by grasses and wildflowers. Um, and then, you know, probably, it'll probably take a good three to five years until you start seeing a lot of this mm, okay. woody species starting to come back. So how about wildlife? Um, you know, I think there's a concern sometimes that, you know, maybe a turkey nest will be burned up or some, some mammals or other species uh, might, might even get killed in the fire. Um, so what do you typically see? I mean, in fact, and I asked this question, but we did just see a, uh, a meadow vole going through the field earlier that seemed to be just fine. Um, but typically, you know, what do you see in terms of effect on wild, in wildlife, both short term and then long term as well? Sure. So um, as sometimes there are casualties. Um, you know, we do our best to uh, make sure that we give wildlife a place to escape, especially your bigger mammals. Um, but sometimes smaller mammals or some amphibians will be negatively affected. But most of them get out of the way. It's, it's, if they can get underground, they get away from the heat. Uh, no issues there. So. Um, but from a wildlife response, um, you know, as soon as it starts growing again, you'll see them in here. But the other big thing, especially with burning fields that we try to be, um, you know, cognizant of is that uh, we keep areas that are unburned in relatively close proximity. We kind of, we call it refuge areas or refugia. So we always make sure that there's like a source population of, of those species in, in relative close proximity. Very cool. Yeah, I know. I've seen, um, I've seen black snakes come out of fire lines and, and be fine or get away from the, the fire line that's moving. Um, I do remember now that you're talking about some of this, I, I did see a rabbit make it out. So I think, yeah, it seems like things sort of naturally can respond just as we would if we saw some danger near um, to sort of get away. So, yeah, and I think it's important to remember too. So even though there may be an individual that gets affected uh, negatively, you know, we're managing for populations on the whole. And, and most of these species over time, you know, have adapted with fire when fire was more prevalent on the landscape. So right. um, no major issues. Right. And I always like to think uh, sort of like you said, the habitat long term is going to, you know, be much healthier. So my last question for you is, um, let's say I'm a hunter and I maybe have a trail camera out on state game lands or a tree stand out somewhere, or maybe even I just want to go check an area out after it's been burned or just be aware that it, it's the, the burn is pending or you have a plan to. Where can I go to find more information or resources for that sort of stuff? Sure. So the best resource, we have a whole page dedicated to prescribed fire on the Game Commission's website. So if you just do a Google search for Pennsylvania Game Commission and prescribed fire, um, you'll, you'll find it. But, but in there, there's an interactive web map uh, that actually shows where all of our burn units are across the state. And then it'll actually show you our priority units. Um, and even there's little icons uh, that will pop on there for the actual day of the burn. So you'll know uh, well in advance. Those priority units will show you, uh, you know, where we plan the burn. So, um, and it'll give you a time frame of roughly when we're going to be burning in there. So if you're concerned about, you know, trail cameras or anything else in the, in the unit, um, you know, you could, you could get them out of there before, before we uh, burn. But the reality is if trail cameras are set up high enough and not really low to the ground, most times they're not, they're not impacted. Gotcha. Well, very good to know. And, uh, Steve, I want to thank you again for talking to us about prescribed fire and having us out here. And thank you again for watching another episode of from the field. Um, you, if you ever get the opportunity, I definitely recommend getting out to an area that has been burned. Check up on it every few months or a year or two. Um, it's really cool to see the results and, and just sort of that evolution of the habitat and uh, the benefits it has to wildlife.